Dispossession is a fundamental theme in the story of South Africa. 20 years into democracy, the consequences of dispossession, forced removal and the loss of land are still felt. It's left millions of South Africans struggling to find dignity, identity and most simply a place to call home. I'm Colin Gambi. Over the next few weeks, ENCA will explore the relationship between government's constitutional mandate to bring about land reform and the way in which ordinary people take part in this process. In 1913, with a stroke of a pen, millions of South Africans lost their land. At the turn of democracy, dispossessed black South Africans were promised that this injustice would be addressed. Since the inception of the restitution program in 1995, almost 80,000 land claims have been lodged. But 400,000 new claims are expected as the deadline for submissions has been extended by five years. ENCA reporter Yusuf Omar takes a look at the human face of this inhumane act. Since they sailed here, European colonizers and their descendants have been removing black South Africans from their land. But a hundred years ago, law and not war would force a native population out of their homes and off their land. The 1913 Land Act set to move millions of black people and the few belongings they could carry to just 7% of the country. Friday morning, June 20, 1913, the South African native found himself not actually a slave, but a prior in the land of his birth. So Plaiki was a man of all seasons, court interpreter, journalist, historian, cultural icon, monarch, was my great-great-grandfather. Plaiki journeyed across South Africa on a bicycle, writing stories about the hurt and loss of ordinary people by laws designed to divide the nation. It was in this brutal winter that he met a young family forced off their farm. Loading all they could onto a wagon, they left but had nowhere to go. The road was long and many of their animals didn't make it. And after just two days in the unforgiving cold, their baby too fell sick and died. Travelling on whites only land, they trembled with fear because even stepping off the road could see them jailed. This young wandering family decided to dig a grave under the cover of the darkness of that night when no one was looking. Black people suddenly found themselves being pushed into a small corner. Without that building block in place, it wouldn't have been possible to put in place apartheid. Plaiki also met a widow named Maria and her three children, who brought life to their land, planting seeds and harvesting crops giving half their produce to a Dutch farmer. But the Native Land Act made black tenant farming illegal. Black people could only live on white-owned farms as servants or farm workers, forced to give up their livestock. At a time when most farmed for a living, it was an economic assassination. And when Maria refused, her home was set alight. Maria was a bed clothes on her head and on the heads of her son and daughter and carrying a three-year-old boy tied to a bag, walked off from the farm, driving her cows before her. But this was just the start of a systematic impoverishment of a nation. You began to see other legislation that then began to affirm and suppress um, uh, the, the black people. If you look at the, the history of, of legislation, you'll see 1913 Land Act set in place those segregated areas. 1923 dealt more strictly with the rural areas. 1936 was the extension of the Land Act. Um, different kind of provisions entrenched segregation very deeply. 1950 Group Areas Act, a seminal um, date in our, in our history. 
because that said, if you're black, you live here. If you're white, you live here. In 1936, the wastelands black South Africans now called home were extended from 7 to 13 percent. But they were still plowing the country's hardest soils and were only allowed to enter farms and cities as temporary workers. In the climate-controlled vaults of the National Library, you'll find maps illustrating the segregation. By the 1960s, black South Africans had not just lost their land, but also their citizenry. Ten ethnically defined Bantu stands or homelands were created. These were separate countries, led by chiefs, but controlled by the apartheid state. Democracy opened the doorway to return land to South Africans, but no one knew how difficult this process would be government promised to transfer 30% of white-owned farming land to black South Africans. But two decades later, only 10% of private lands have been transferred. Returning land to black South Africans doesn't seem to be a priority for government, allocating less than 1% of the national budget to land reform. To date, the state has spent 42 billion rand on land restitution half of which went to cash payouts to claimants as most preferred financial compensation to land. There are still thousands of people waiting for their land to be returned. And government recently reopened the process by extending the deadline. Enter the Restitution of Land Rights Amendment Act. Nearly 400,000 new claims are expected over the next five years. These include calls from the Zulu chiefs for land based on 1838 boundaries and the Khoisan, known as the First Nation. These new claims are estimated to cost the state 179 billion rand. And at the current rate of settling claims, it would take 144 years to settle. So, Blakey. Finally ascended to higher service in 1932 after immense contribution towards his people. If he was still alive, crisscrossing this country on his bicycle, what do you think, what stories we could have related to at present day? Land restitution isn't just about rebuilding homes and giving back farms. It's about pain, loss, and acknowledging the human suffering of the young family who lost their child or Maria who lost her home. And now more than ever, it's about regaining dignity. Yusuf Omar, Johannesburg. In February this year, President Jacob Zuma encouraged the National House of Traditional Leaders to take advantage of the Restitution of Land Rights Amendment Bill. For those who missed the deadline to lodge a claim, the new cutoff date had been extended to 2019. But it's created a number of political, cultural and economic dilemmas, as ENCA reporter Tulasizos Melane finds out. In Gwakangato, near Babanango, northern KwaZulu Natal, Msizeni Makwaza and his community have long lived on this land. Singabok Tabu Galapa, a longe Wungapa Wami, Umzalawami, Uzbonello, Umkun, a 
ukoko wake wayibambi le sanjwa na besuga engome besuga la betunye umbomboish ukuthi bayolwa namabhunu le ukuthi ukhokho wakhe siyazalana lono umama welanywa ubabo wakhe lo mina ke ukhokho wami waye khona esandlwana umkhulu isilo sakwanobamba udini zulu sazi ngamehla in the 1980s they were forcibly removed when the farms were turned into plantations for paper mills those that stayed worked for white farmers in return for living on the land and keeping their cattle. They lodged a restitution claim in 1998. Government tells them it is still in the research phase. Their hope for restitution has not only been dampened by administrative delays. There are also other powerful players with an interest in this land. Amafa Trust, the Provincial Heritage Conservation Agency, and the Ingonyama Trust, which is aligned with King Goodwill Zwelitini. Ngogwazwe to isa on God, abantu bawa land affairs, noma bawa rural development. Sego neskasha na sabati nile. Uti bestel uti kukubera aning eklemit abak tine beru shobate amafa awafunu bata isela umshab imariko. The Amafa Trust bought the land from its previous owners, fencing off a portion of the farm to create a game reserve. This prevented the Guaganato community grazing their livestock and accessing the main water source. Disaster followed. La pa gritin jengu ma bona matamba kwele intabala. Kwa tu agai lozi si fusi kamu agule zinjamazani. Yizo bono to hotel ba yazi tina sas buto sas ukse benzala ima plaza. Oto hotel ba tike yoku kufa kamu agai zinjamazani na kupunza kwenye kwenye busi na zingo. Iko agai yoku na koloko sas kala gubo abama. Wudi kabo bosi am si 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 mu vatin si alashere elwatin. As a salim, in full of footage pillangayo, a Sahon pillangayo, Iafa. Ubekona Bakamga Bakunu, Mabonabaton Pegayo, that is the size of Kubera's Ali Yamaza. While the Wakanga to land claim remains unresolved, local reports suggest that King Goodwill's Velitini wishes to build a new palace on the land, his eighth. Axwali Gashi, a waste of food. I am over. Sizonda in the cool. See Tant in Pale in the cool. Eh, Tina Esifuna Tat Lumsabas as Ruti Amafa, a Rahulmain. A taller Isabel O'Malley, who Hulmain. Manje is cut a seat at Tina Saz Ruti's Kuluma and Amafa, Kahulmain. Eh, Ruti and Manje, Umsabo Sunga Pansy, Gwenguyama Trust. Naloko who sends rooting and pella and pella, Siakela no rooty who advocate Tulima Tonsella. Again, Ganele, Lento, again, the figure M Tangen, why Sitole Ingo Nulu, why I can root and Wednesday. The Ingo Yama Trust administers around 2.8 million hectares on behalf of communities in Guazulu Natal. It's preparing a multi billion rand land claim which will cover land taken from 1838 onwards. In some instances, this massive claim overlaps with land already claimed by other communities and clans, including the people of Guacangato. This community is now at the point of despair. The position is that they will file a claim in the name of the Zulu Nation because land was taken from traditional leadership. A detailed research will have to be done so that we don't claim that which does not belong to us. The Ingonyama Trust's ambitious plans have been encouraged by promises made by politicians. I think those who are claiming should find good lawyers. But there is one crucial obstacle, the existing law. 
The amendment to the 1994 Restitution of Land Rights Act, signed into law this year, may have extended the deadline for new claims for another five years, but it does not make provisions for land lost prior to 1913. Confusion came directly from the president. This is not a small matter. It's a matter that, in my view, you could put together your resources to look at this law, to look at the claims on behalf of your people. The president has been saying to the Khoisan, you, you'll be able to claim. He's been saying to the houses of traditional leaders, get your lawyers, put in your claims. He's implied that the 1913 cutoff date has been changed. But the law did not change it, and the law could have changed it, because the Constitution gives a base of rights, but you, government can always do better than that. So they could have gone further back in time, and they didn't. They chose not to, actually for very good reasons, because when you go further back in time, how do you, how do you sort out all the overlapping rights of, that different people occupy the land at different times? If you have a land right or a dispossession that happened before 1913, the Act does not allow us as a commission on restitution of land right to deal with that. Um, however, I'm, uh, I know that the Minister of Rural Development is engaging various uh, parties, especially the Khoi and the San communities, for us to begin to engage on the question of how do we deal with um, uh, historic uh, landmarks, heritage sites, the Khoi and the Sun. The, the, the purpose of the exceptions is to actually augment uh, that law to, to ensure that we're not confined to the restitution uh, uh, law, but rather we, we create a program uh, over time which will take us, which will consider uh, the Khoi and the Sun because they were dispossessed long time ago. But one of the main issues is whether people in rural areas who fall under traditional authorities benefit from land restitution. In rural South Africa, the economy depends on who controls the land and the cultivation of subsistence and small-scale farms. But this may be at odds with the interests of chiefs who administer the so-called traditional land and the people living in these areas, many of whom prefer cooperative arrangements independent of Amakosi. The Guakangato claimants attended a workshop where communities were given a platform to voice their concerns about the conflict between their need to live on and work the land with the demands of Amakosi. Last year, Customary law formulated under colonialism and strengthened under apartheid was used as a means of indirect rule. Some feel that this has yet to change. <laughs> it took course it in a sna in dao. In dao a os. So as na lilung elologuti si claiming a massim ega despila wall. Basically what's happening is chiefs are feeling threatened by the fact that some people have independent ownership. Because if you're an independent owner, you can't be threatened with eviction. So they have now come up with an idea that the only form of ownership that's appropriate 
in the form of Bantustans is tribal ownership. And the irony is that that is the very idea used by the colonialists when they dispossessed African land. They said, these systems don't constitute property rights for their members, and therefore this land is free for the taking. Again, now, 100 years later, 200 years later, the state is saying, customary law doesn't constitute property rights for the making, this, uh, uh, doesn't constitute property rights for the members, this land is, is free, free for the taking by, ch by chiefs and by the state. The chief does not own land. The chief owns, is, is only a custodian over the land on behalf of the people. So it can be, therefore, that it is a chief that, that actually benefits. Traditional, I'm talking traditional, that benefits at the expense of the people. It cannot be. It doesn't work that way in tradition. So we want to make sure that uh, we are clear about that so that it is a community that benefits from the land and the chief as part of the community will benefit from the land. And if he is legitimate or she is legitimate, there's no reason why the chief should fear his or her people. Within traditional political structures of KwaZulu Natal, ordinary people are subjects of the Amakosi and every Inkosi is a subject of the king. The king therefore controls the land and the Amakosi are its custodians. We moved from what uh, in Zulu, I mean, the, 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 what we often hear people say, Inkosi, Inkosi, Nabantu, to a situation where today, uh, I think one can safely say Inkosi, Inkosi, a uh, chief is a chief by the government. And if you look at the law, uh, the appointment of uh, Makos is done by the state. And so it becomes questionable whose interests uh, Makos serve. We are born a queen dow and in Dando in Jengen Dows Amakos again against the Jisbonel. Uma, we are a me country near Makos look to my traditional councils. A ketong in Dando in Ning, Uzek Bekona, U sixty per cent, or Owa in Gosu Bekon forty per cent, or Ketwa Bantu Democratic. So a Gukola, the Sugabe Prince of Legacon. A eco in Dao. A cool leg and a vulele, a band to Jenny Dawia Semakai. We are all Ubene Vumeluano in Gonyama Trassi Kamu Gangoba, Eo Egu, Eo Epsigete, Emene Jum Shaba on behalf of Amakos. Ibe Ube Eo Ebuga Zonkes in Dokbatin to a band to Babi in Lange, a guaz would tip to a Amakos, a Gukola, or These contradictory understandings between government, the chiefs, and the people about who owns the land affect the management of its use. The problem is that you have traditional councils and traditional institutions that are busy delegitimizing themselves by getting involved in business and getting big share of business. People going to them instead of them, when somebody gets to them and say, I want to run business here, I want to explore mining, I want forestry, Instead of calling the people and saying to the people, this is what you have, what is your decision, have you got the structure, organize people accordingly, so that people, people can benefit. In addition to these political problems faced by the people of Guakangato and structures like the Ingonyama Trust, the entire land restitution process faces additional administrative and logistical challenges. The Department of Rural Development estimates the cost would be almost 180 billion rand over 15 years. And that's excluding land claims founded in earlier centuries. The process of taking the land from the indigenous people took centuries, took different forms, and finally ended with the huge majority of the indigenous people with no land. It took wars, it took laws, many things. But when we were supposed to address this matter, we were only given a few years to deal with it. And we felt it was unfair. We acknowledge that it's going to be an expense to the, to the states, but I believe that it's an expense that is necessary because the consequences of ignoring 
the plight of the most vulnerable of our society is one that we can ill afford. When we deal with land, we must know we're not dealing with money. We're dealing with human lives, we're dealing with people with emotions, with aspirations. The reopening of the land restitution process has also paved the way for what could perhaps be the most complicated and ambitious land claim conceivable in South Africa. We are first indigenous people to this country and that's why we are entitled. Everybody else came when we were here. Whoever came to this country came to us. On the basis of this understanding, Khoisan organizations want to lodge a land claim that will cover a large chunk of South Africa. For them, it's not just a gesture of ownership. It's to re-establish a sense of belonging. Griqua people are tied to their land via their birthrights, via spiritually. Uh, you can't separate the two, a Griqua person and his land. Sometimes we come here alone belong. when yeah. you just want you to be in, here. In, mm. in peace or with your soul or, or yeah. search your inner self. I drive up here, get the key, just come up come here alone. And relax. Just sit and listen yeah. to the, the wind blowing yeah. through the trees. It, it, it revives you. you yeah, know? it revives you. Yeah. It does something to you. Mm. 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 When you think and you, 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 you just think about your people that lived here. This belongs to us. This is our history, it's our ancestors. culture, yeah. our ancestors. Man. Our ancestors are not happy at the As the law stands, Ralph Reuters is still excluded from claiming his ancestors' land. Addressing his needs will complicate government's task of mediating between competing claimants. While some criticize land restitution as too complex and costly, it remains an essential part if South Africa is to restore dignity to all who live in it. This is not about money, it's about justice. For more information on ENCA's land reform series, you can visit our website on the address that appears on your screen. You can also tune in to special panel discussions on Tuesday evenings at 8 p.m where experts will thresh out some of the key issues in the debate around South Africa's land reform process. I'm Kholim Gambi, and thank you for watching.